There are secrets out there, guys, performance marketing secrets, and knowing just one or two of them can absolutely light up your funnels. Let's go. This is the Revenue Driven CMO. I'm your host, Chris Mechanic. Join me as I uncover the secrets of the world's most elite CMOs marketing leaders. The Revenue Driven CMO is sponsored by Web Mechanics, the AI-driven performance agency that makes you smarter. Hello, everybody. Welcome to another exciting episode of Revenue Driven CMO. I'm your man, Chris Mechanic, here with a really, really exciting guest today. Uh, this is a guest who uh, is a longtime marketer, a true uh, badass in many ways, a published author of a New York Times bestselling book called How Not to Suck at Marketing. Uh, he was previously CMO and also CEO of Park Mobile, uh, which was an exciting and fast-growing startup, currently CMO at Greenlight Guru. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the show, Mr. Jeff Perkins. How are you doing, Jeff? I am great. Thanks for having me on the show. Absolutely, man. I'm excited to have you. I was telling I was telling Jeff pre-show anybody that writes a book called How Not to Suck at Marketing is is good good with me. I love Just to that. be completely honest, I think you you made up the New York Times bestseller part. Did I? No, I could have sworn I'd seen that. <laughs> I, th- I I was like number one on Amazon for two hours, I think, and I took a screenshot of it. But that's that's about the. Uh, the pinnacle of my uh, my my authorship uh, accolades. Nice. Well, we'll talk all about that in a few. But you know our style. We like to lead with the good stuff. Uh, so if you could tell us what what's one of your best kept secrets to success in marketing? I'd say my best kept secret. I, I don't know that's even a secret because I wrote about it in the book. But the thing I think has been sort of the key to the success I've had at different companies has been what I call the quick win strategy. And the quick win strategy is really all about when you join an organization, uh, a lot of marketers have a tendency to take on really, really big initiatives first. Mm -hmm. And you, you go in and you look around, you're like, oh man, we got to redo the brand and we have to rip and replace the marketing automation system. And we have to totally overhaul the website. And those are all projects that probably you do have to do at some point and are probably really important, but you have to realize those take a long time. Yep. And it's just a tendency of marketers to kind of gravitate towards those kind of projects. When I go into an organization, I try to find the low hanging fruit. I try to find the quick wins. What Mm. can I do very fast, like this week or in two weeks that'll show some results? Yeah. And the reason I do that is not necessarily because I think those are the highest impact things on the business. No, you know, uh, redoing the brand oftentimes is going to be much higher impact than uh, some quick win. But the reason you take on the quick wins first is to build credibility in the organization. Mm -hmm. So if you are someone that comes in and you want to do a six, six, 12 month project, um, you have to realize you're not going to be showing any results for six to 12 months. Right. People in the executive suite are going to start getting really nervous about hey, what kind of marketing leader did we just hire? Right. This person, this person's kind of come in and I don't really know what they're doing all day. And that's yep. when marketers oftentimes get in big trouble. And so uh, that's my advice. When you come into an organization, the biggest thing you need to do first is build credibility within your executive team that like, oh, okay, this guy gets it. He knows what he's doing. He's yeah. putting runs on the board. And I have the confidence now that this person can take on those bigger projects. So that's always the advice I give to people coming into a job, especially is like identify those quick wins. And it could be something simple like, hey, our collateral is a mess. Let's redo it. You know, like, like really easy things that'll kind of get you some of that credibility. And then when you have that credibility, your executives will be very comfortable in you taking on bigger projects that take longer. Uh, to deliver. And and so that, that I think is the big uh, piece of advice I have for anyone coming into a new job as a marketer. Don't get stuck in the big projects that take forever. Just do some small things first to show that you are capable, to show that you get it, to build the credibility with the executive team, and then do the bigger things later on. I love that. 
uh, Jeff, you have no idea actually how aligned I am to that quick win strategy to the to the tune where that's actually the first step in our process. Like when anytime we get a new client, we start with two things: quick wins and then getting the data tight, like just getting the analytics, you know, at house in order. So I'm incredibly aligned with that, and I'm and I, I'm curious because I have a grab bag of quick wins. Like you could point me at any org or any website and there's like 17 different things that I can look at for potential quick wins. I'm curious about what some of yours are. But before we get into that, why do you think that more marketers don't do that or think like that? Like why is it that the tendency is to gravitate toward those bigger projects at the start? I think when you come into an organization and you look and survey the field, your tendency is to look at the things that you know, can make the biggest impact and like Mm -hmm. the brand or, you know, plugging in your marketing automation platform, like those can make really big impacts on the business. Yeah. And if they're broken, it's going to be really challenging for you as a marketer. Like if you don't have a good foundational brand, if you don't have the the MarTech stack you need, uh, it's going to be hard to deliver what you want to deliver for the business. Yeah. And so I think that's why marketers tend to go there. And marketers also oftentimes have a playbook like, hey, I like to work in Marketo and I like to run these kind of programs and yeah. I need this tech stack for me to execute the campaigns I want to execute. And so in some ways, uh, I think a lot of marketers have a feeling like they can't be successful unless they get their stuff in place, right? Yeah. Unless they could kind of you know, get their playbook set up so they can execute off of that. That That's a very common tendency I see. But yeah. the problem is that a lot of those marketers end up getting fired before they could actually execute what they want to execute. And why do they right. get fired? Because they didn't put the quick wins on the board first. So they yeah. didn't have the credibility. So my advice is always take a little more time on those big initiatives. So you mm-hmm. have a, you have a couple, yeah, you have some some weeks and some cycles where you're just showing you're a competent marketer, you're a competent professional that you get it, that you're trying to help push the company forward before you do some big rip and replace of marketing automation. I mean, I have, I have worked across every marketing automation platform. You know, it's like you've HubSpot and Marketo and Eloqua and, and Exact Target and Pardot. Yeah, uh, you know, implementing those tools are not easy. Ripping out the current tool and then putting in a new tool, really not easy. It's right. months and months. And so you just have to ask yourself, am I going to put all of my capital into that project? Right. And all of my credibility into that project that probably won't show results for, for you know, it takes 12 months to do the work and, and another 12 months to start seeing the results. So that's now two years in before you're really showing any progress, any results, uh, I'm not, I'm not placing that bet on myself. <laughs> yeah. You know, and I it, mean, it, it makes, if the business isn't growing, you're going to be walked out the door. And so you, you got to figure out how do I, how do I do the short-term projects that help the business at least get some momentum and grow while I'm taking on some of these bigger projects that I know we need to have for the long term. And, and so that's why I think a lot of marketers just don't think that way because it's like, the brand and and the the campaigns and the tech stack are are so important to success. Yeah. But you have to figure out ways to work around those so you can make an impact in the short term. Yep. I totally I totally 110% align with you. Uh and any time that we're, you know, pitching a deal to a client and we bring that up, like the head start not like like the executive team loves that. So I think that's amazing advice. Um, your video froze, unfortunately. If you want to maybe oh, try pausing it and and re-enabling it. Uh, oh, but sorry. even... Uh, even um, There you go. You're back. So let's, let's spend a few minutes swapping some quick wins. Because like I said, I've got a long laundry list. Um, and I'll go first if you want. Go so, for it. Chris's quick win, number one, one of my favorite ones is retargeting. Mm. Retargeting is inexpensive. It is effective. Most brands are underutilizing it. You know, they might have retargeting on Google display, 
usually that retargeting is your standard like 30 day look back window any visitor to any page of the site so it's very kind of superficial but it's rare to have good coordinated and aligned retargeting especially across platforms you know so like they'll have it on google display but it won't be on linkedin or it won't be on twitter or it won't they won't have anything running on youtube and for a lot of b2b's like if you tell them youtube they'll kind of roll your eyes at you but the whole idea of retargeting is that the audience is limited to a segment of people that have already been to your website right so like if if there's pushback on youtube it's like okay well then let's limit the audience to only people that say viewed multiple pages where none of those pages were careers pages say mm. and at least one of the pages was a demo request page but they didn't fill out the form you know so so that's that's my uh quick and dirty my usually one of my um first things that I look at and an added bonus is that the executives will start seeing those mm -hmm. ads everywhere. Um, but the actual cost is not very much because the audiences are so small. So like, that's a really visible, you know, kind of quick win. And they'll be like, man, great job, Jeff. Like it's only been a week and I'm seeing ads everywhere. You're killing it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. When, um, early in my career, I was, uh, you know, I was in advertising industry and I Procter and Gamble was my account. And whenever we would do a campaign for P and G, I worked on the tide brand. Uh, we would always make sure we budgeted for one billboard and it was somewhere in Cincinnati near the Procter and Gamble headquarters. Yeah. Yeah. And we exactly. made sure that was the best looking billboard, uh, possible because you're right. I mean, clients, uh, you know, everyone's a consumer of marketing and advertising, yeah. And there's something special when they see that out in the wild that mm -hmm. uh, it really shows that, you know, you're you're adding value to the business. You just have to instruct them, especially with digital advertising, like don't click on that, dude, because it's, uh, <laughs> then we pay right. for it. So just watch right. it, enjoy it, but don't click. Yeah, exactly. All right, cool. So your turn. I, I would say my quick win is usually spend, spending some time to figure out where the watering holes are in your category. Now, I've worked in a lot of different businesses, a lot of industries, a lot of categories. And one truth I've found is that in every category, there's usually a handful of places that become the watering holes. And those are the places where your prospects are you know, learning about your kind of products. Yeah. And I'll go back to experience I had at a company called QA Symphony, where I worked. Mm -hmm. QA Symphony, we made software for software testers, like mm -hmm. QA testers. And when I started the business, I was looking around, I was like, where do these people go for information? And I found all these like niche blog sites, like, right. um, like softwaretestinghelp.com. Right. And all of these sites had uh, lists of the top 20 plus test case management tools. And that's the category we were in. And yep. we were on all the lists, but we were kind of far down in the rankings. We were in like the teens. Mm -hmm. And so we said, well, what would it take to get us further up the rankings? So we reached out to all the publishers of these sites. And again, super niche. It was like a one man shop. Mm -hmm. And we said, hey, we'd like you to uh, consider to move us up because we think we're better than a bunch of the people ahead of us. Mm -hmm. And they came back and said, well, if you pay us, we'll make you number one. And so we paid them and we like, 10 X star leads overnight, just be just through improved prominence at the watering holes where our prospects were going to learn about the category, because all of these niche sites, they all ranked number one, two, three on Google. If you said, what's the best test case management tool, those were the yep. sites that came up. Right. Yep. And so they became critical parts and the cost to, to advertise or to increase our prominence on these key pages it was like $2,000 for the year, wow. <laughs> like for the year negotiated directly with the publisher of the site. So when I talk about finding those watering holes, I mean, they exist in every category and it could be niche sites. It could be, uh, it could be on Reddit. It could be on industry pubs, but figure out where those watering holes are that the customer is hitting up across of their journey and make sure you're in the most prominent position you can be on those sites and you you will see results. It's it's amazing when it works because I mean, so many marketers are like, I'm just going to plow everything into Google, and I'm going to 
do this kind of content syndication thing that's super expensive. I'm going to do tech target and all the, so they always, there's like all these plays you can do, but sometimes just figuring out, talking to your customers that you just closed one, how'd you find out about us? What were your sources of research? Tell me the sites you went to. And then yeah. really honing in on that customer journey and then making sure you have you have the best prominence possible at those touch points and it will it will work. That's a great idea. Find the watering holes and and sponsor them. And you can usually find them just by searching for your like for your main category's keyword. Like if you're yeah. you know if you're at HR software, you can usually search for HR software. Yeah, a I very valuable that. exercise that I found is that when you win a deal right after get connected with the guy who is the decision maker that did the research talk to that person about their journey and and that's what i did at, at qa symphony i said i started calling all these customers and just so how'd you find out about us well i knew i wanted a new test case management tool i went to google i searched what's the best test case management tool and all these sites come up that rank the best test case management tools and i went yeah. to all of them and you were number one on every list yeah. so you make the short list. Right? Yeah. And, and they're used like, I couldn't believe it. I, you were number one everywhere I looked. So I figured you guys were worth looking at. And we ended up winning. And, and But that was every single close one deal. That was the story I was hearing. So I said, all right, we got to really go all in with these sites because this is how people find out about us. This is how we get on the short list. This is how we generate leads for the sales guys. Yeah. And, uh, and coincidentally, I bet that helped uh, QA Symphony to rank on those terms as well. Because if you get a link pointing to your website from the people that are ranking number one already, well, guess what? You'll probably be ranking number two. It, it dramatically helped our SEO. And then we said, after we you know, got prominence on all of these watering hole sites, then we said, okay, how do we rank for this? Like we want to rank for this too. And so then we started building out our SEO strategy around best test case management tools. And then, yeah. you know, over the course of the next really six to 12 months, we started climbing in the rankings and eventually we were the number one site. <laughs> That's so awesome. we were the number one site for best test case management tools. And then everyone under us, we were also number one ranked on. And so we had kind of cornered the market around all of the search activity related to test case management software. And it really, it really worked well for us. I mean, we grew that company from a million when I joined to, to 20 million in like two years. And wow. it just, it, it, we just had this inbound engine going that was really effective for us. Wow. That's awesome. That's scrappy. I love scrappy, low budget style techniques like that man, you should teach a course or something. You should like go to a university and be, be the, the marketing instructor, <laughs> but Hey, um, I'm really enjoying this and I can tell because I'm losing track of time. Like I'm, I would love to have you back and just do a whole episode on more quick win techniques. Um, but let's talk about green light a little bit. I'm really curious. Uh, well, could you just tell us a little bit, like, I know that it is in a niche and I'm, I'm sure that that same watering hole technique would work like a charm uh, for green light, but uh, just tell us a little bit about it. And um, I know you haven't been there for very long, but if you want to include uh, any win stories that you have so far, or some of those quick win techniques that you're pursuing, I'd love to hear about it. Yeah. So green light guru is a software company and we operate in the, the med tech space or the medical device space. So we specifically serve companies that make life-changing type medical devices, everything like intuitive from intuitive surgical. Yeah. It's a heart or... stent. It's a diabetes patch. It's a, uh, it's prosthetics. Uh, we have a really, really interesting range of customers. We have over 1100 customers across the world actually. And so oh, wow. Um, our software helps them in a couple of ways. Uh, we help them with their quality processes. So mm -hmm. if you think about getting a medical device to market, either in the U S or Europe, tons of regulation, tons of documentation required. Yeah. The traditional way companies would do a lot of the, the quality management part of their job was, uh, good old fashioned paper, like literally like physical paper. And then they started doing it in Excel spreadsheets and word documents and SharePoint and it was a totally inefficient process. And, yeah. and it really bottlenecked the ability of these companies to get their life-changing devices into the market. And yeah. so we created uh, what's called an EQMS 
basically it, it digitizes uh, all of the, the regulatory documentation part of the business. And the companies that implement and use our EQMS, they are able to move much faster, uh, get these products uh, to market quicker. They're much more efficient with the resources they have. And so it's it really ends up being uh, a product that um, really makes a, a, a measurable impact for the companies that adopt it. And so it's, yeah. it's been a it's a it's a really a great great SaaS solution for businesses. We also work on the clinical trial side where we collect uh, help companies uh, modernize the way they collect the data related to their clinical trials. Again, process that used to be in paper on paper with you know with with pencil to paper or on spreadsheets. Now yeah. it's in a SaaS solution, makes it much easier for them to manage all the data related to clinical trials. So it's a, it's a vertical SaaS play, but yeah. it answers a, just a huge need. And what is a very large market of companies across the world that make medical devices? Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. Um, and you've been there, it looks like just under a year. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. I've, uh, it'll be a year in December. We're sitting here in August now. So in December, it'll be a, a full year at the company. Nice. And I see uh, I'm on the, the site right now. It looks like you uh, have done some SEO work. Like I could see the page titles have some nice keyword uh, density in them. But uh, but what what quick wins or what I like? I like your phrase put runs on the board. Like what runs have you put on the board so far? A lot of what we've been focusing on at Greenlight Guru right now is um, kind of a shift to, from from serving very small companies, and and that that's kind of where we started. Where it was, uh, we call them two doctors in a dream. Uh, that, that <laughs> these guys who are startups, they're trying to build a, a medical device, get it to market. And you know, when I came in and really looked at the opportunity. Um, serving the low end of the market is great, but then if we can start to pivot into larger companies, into the enterprise, that's really yeah. where a huge opportunity is for us. So we've we've got you know 1,100 plus companies that have signed on with us. Most are smaller, but more recently we've changed sort of some of our um, we've changed our content a lot. So mm -hmm. we used to publish a lot of content around how startups can get medical devices to market. Mm -hmm. Now our content is much more about how to get your medical device from the U.S. to Europe or from Europe to the U.S. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. How larger companies need to think about medical device management, and so we're we're really we put together a really great content package that's aimed at at upmarket customers, mm -hmm. and so that's probably that was the first quick win because building content oftentimes you can do that relatively quickly, and we have we have really good writers on staff, we have a lot of knowledgeable people in the organization. So that was probably the the first big quick win was pivoting our content strategy from startups to larger customers. And now as we see the kinds of companies that are engaging with our content, you're starting to see Johnson & Johnson and Philips and Medtronic, these big companies yeah. coming in because we're doing content that's much more relevant to them. And, and yeah. so that was probably one of the first quick wins I put on the board is just changing up the content strategy focusing on larger companies and we're starting to see the results already. You know, I'll give a shout out to our entire team. <laughs> we have a we have a really good team in place uh, across our our lead gen group, our product marketing team, our content team. Um it, it's really um I'm very lucky. You know, sometimes when you come into a company you don't know what you're going to inherit. I've inherited a very high performing team. Uh, and so I feel very lucky and fortunate to, to be able to lead them. And, to, you know, it's, it's a really good group of people. So it sounds like you're doing some amazing things uh, at Greenlight Guru. It sounds like you've got uh, a really talented team behind you. What are some of the challenges that you're facing? Like what's keeping you up at night? I think probably one of the big challenges that we're facing, and I think a lot of SaaS companies are facing right now, or just some of the economic headwinds that we're encountering yeah. in uh, you know 2020, 2021. It was it's kind of like shooting fish in a barrel. It was just there, there was so much business. Everyone was a buyer, and it was uh, those were really good times for a company like Greenlight Guru. And I think it's just like every company. It's been harder. I mean, we're doing very very well. We're growing very fast, 
but it's just been more challenging. And it's not because customers aren't interested in our product. Actually, we all the leading metrics continue to grow. The leads, the website traffic are all very healthy. It's it's harder to get deals across the finish line now. And yeah. so one of the things that we've done uh, was we built an ROI calculator for our teams mm -hmm. because just selling features and benefits, it, it's not working anymore. You really have to sell uh, the economic value of what you're bringing to a customer. Yeah. So we rolled this out last quarter. It's been very successful for us. So it shows basically if you have this investment in Greenlight Guru software, this is your payback. This is how yeah. you calculate your ROI based on improved speed, improved efficiency, uh, you know, getting the product to market faster, recognizing yeah. revenue off that product faster. And so that was really a, a great, that's a great tool for our salespeople, especially in this environment where it's just harder to get deals across the finish line. You're seeing sales cycles uh, get longer. And so yeah. that's probably the biggest challenge we're dealing with is how do we continue to get our prospects focused on the real value that we can bring to their business and, and giving them the tools to quantify that. The other thing, and this is something that uh, companies have to deal with as they're going up market. Um, when like when you go from targeting very small companies where oftentimes you're working directly with the CEO who has the buying power, now you're talking to buying committees, right? Yeah. Now you have uh, someone who's probably your champion but that person has to be able to sell the product in the organization. So they they may want it, yeah. but they may not know how to sell it to their CFO or the VP of finance and make the business case. Mm -hmm. So we've also spent a lot of time building, building assets to help train our customers on how to make the business case to sell up in their organization. And again, mm -hmm. that's been very successful. So you combine those kind of like building the business case trainings with an ROI calculator, with a lot of our great case studies and, and awards from places like G2, you yeah. try to make this bulletproof case that, hey, uh, this, is the, this is the software you need to buy. This is yeah. a software that's mission critical for your business. And this is a software where you can clearly see the ROI. You clearly yep. see it. Whatever you pay Greenlight Guru, you're going to see that return within the first really first six months of uh, of using the software. So, you know, it's just trying to, to make a stronger case than maybe you had to make in the past when everyone was buying software and it was growth at all costs. Now you have to really arm your sales team with the tools. You have to arm your prospects with uh, the tools so they can make the business case. So that's been really the shift, but it's, it's working. Uh, we're still getting a lot of deals over the finish line. Um, it's just, we just have to do it a little bit differently maybe than we did it in the past. Yeah, no, absolutely. And that brings up a really good point. Cause I think like in 2020, 2021, when it was, you know, the real heyday, when marketers would talk about mid funnel content and bottom funnel content, they were still generally talking about content that took place like before the sales conversation. But I think adding like truly middle and bottom of funnel content, meaning content to arm your salespeople with that, you know, can calculate ROI. Uh, there could be like an objection handler doc, like in the form of a mm -hmm. frequently asked questions, right? So like, boom, before you even get a chance to, you know, make that objection or ask that question, it's like already, you know, assuaged pre, uh, preemptively. Yeah. But that's, yeah. that's a really good call. Yeah. And, you know, I, I think you have to look at that kind of content two ways. One, you have to look at it as great tools for the salespeople to use as they have prospects in funnel. Mm -hmm. But you know, we all know that most prospects, they're doing their own research. Uh, they're not talking to sales all the time. So I like to enable sort of a, a choose your own adventure journey for, for the prospect. So yeah. uh, essentially, you use the website as a virtual salesperson. So everything you get from a, a a real salesperson, you can get that same content on the website and you try yep. to construct that journey. So a prospect can come to the website, consume some content, watch a demo, read some uh, thought leadership, uh, yep. really get into the weeds of, of data sheets and technical specifications, run their own ROI analysis through our website, which we give them that tool available as well. So um, we really try to arm 
uh, our prospects with everything they need to really enable their journey with or without a sales rep. And yeah. so that's a that's a really important part of the process, making sure you have the right content, making sure it's it's on your website in a way that's easy to consume and that uh, and that you're looking into analytics to make sure it's all working the way it should. Yeah. And that's a real a real uh, shift in thinking because you know, the, uh, the almighty gate, like most companies, especially SaaS companies keep almost all of that sort of sales enablement material behind the gate, but make your website into the world's best 24 seven salesperson. That's brilliant. And, um, you know, uh, we had the CMO of HubSpot on the pod a while back and that was his topic. Uh, and we're HubSpot users, we're HubSpot partners. Like we've been involved with HubSpot for many years. And I can tell you, they do exactly that, like to the point where like they'll be, you'll be on a call with one of their sales teams and they're sharing their screen, but they're not sharing a PowerPoint deck. They're just like on one of their web pages, you know, showing you in real time what they're actually, what they're actually saying. So it's like, take your PowerPoint deck and, you know, and transform it into, uh, into web pages that can be accessed and you keep yeah. all that stuff ungated, I imagine. Yeah, I think um, you know buyers have a lot of fatigue with forms. Yeah, and so you you have to really ask yourself when you're putting a, a new piece of content up: Do we have to gate this? And some right. stuff you should gate if it's very very high quality, um, or if it's you know if it's like an industry research study that's brand new. No issue with gating it. Obviously, if you're you have doing a webinar, you kind of have to gate it because it's a you need to have the registration. Uh, but most of the things we publish, we un are ungated. And then if you want to download it, maybe we'll put a registration form to download it. So we do have a, we, we try to have a hybrid model where you can't just download everything. So if, if you really are engaged in this piece of content and you want the PDF, we see that actually as a, as a buying indication. Like you're, you're probably pretty serious and we want to at least get your contact information um, to have in our database so we can keep, we can keep marketing to you through yeah. email. Because uh, the the thing that is, continues to amaze me with all this modern tech out there and all this these cool tools out there is that the the top two lead drivers for us, the top two for for demo requests, continue to be good old fashioned email and SEO, right? Yeah. It, it, like <laughs> it's like everything else, you know, all these account based tools, all these cool things. It's still email and SEO are the big lead drivers for us, and mm. so. You know, we want to make sure we have a great database. We're continuing to grow that database because we know that's that's how you drive leads for the business. And a company like Greenlight Guru, we really have an amazing repository of content. Yeah. And so, you know, when we get someone in, we're just able to build the relationship because we're pro providing them with content that actually has real value. Yeah. And and you know, one of the great compliments we always get is people often say. I didn't even realize you were a software company. I thought you were like a, a media company. I thought you were just a, a company that would provides, you know, really interesting thought leadership to the industry. Um, and that's a great place to be, right? Uh, I mean, we have, um, it's it's amazing. We have the number one podcast in the industry. Not, not just- I saw that. Like, not just a, a podcast that's like a podcast that serves the, the, the number one podcast. 300,000 people have listened to the podcast this year. And I mean, think about that as a as a as a marketing tool, a marketing platform to build off of when you can build that kind of audience up and then you are able to leverage that and associate it with your brand. It just it's just very, very powerful. Yeah. So what's next? Uh, what's uh, what's on your agenda for Q4 for next year? What are you guys investing in or, or what big initiatives are coming down the pike? I think I talked a bit about you know our play going up market. That's probably the biggest one. We are um, in the process though of doing a bit of a rebrand uh, for the the overall company that we have and and the, the the product offering. We you know we acquired a company last year and we've kind of had separate brands running. So we we need to get these brands into kind of a proper uh, market architecture. So we have that coming up. Um, but I think I think the big thing for us, I think we've we've got the formula down. It's it's high quality content to create demand, and then a lot of tactics out there to capture that demand, and then really good thoughtful tools around ROI 
to get that those people down the funnel to convert yeah. into a close one deal. And so I think on the the marketing side, we really have the engine humming, um, and it's just continuing to kind of kind of put fuel uh, fuel on the fire to to get more leads in. Um, and and I think getting the bigger companies in that's really the focus, making sure that people see because our software is is fantastic. Um, but sometimes when you, you know, when you get associated with, oh, that that's the software for small companies, we yeah. need the software for big companies. Right. Um, and so there's some perception changing that has to happen, uh, within our base of customers that, Hey, actually our software is great for big companies. And we have a ton of large com- companies that have come on board, uh, and have, are now using our software and seeing great success with it. So it's, it's kind of, it's some some perception change there that still has to happen. And that's the kind of thing. It just doesn't happen overnight. So the, those are really the focus areas for us going forward. That's awesome. And well, I could talk to you for hours. Uh, you're very impressive. I, I, I'm really impressed by your sort of blend of, you know, high level, like, you know, uh, view of the entire field, um, perspective. But then also, you know how to get scrappy. Like, it sounds like you can get scrappy, you can get in platform, you know, SEO. Um, and there's not a lot of marketers that do both of those things very well. Yeah, I, I know enough to be dangerous at a lot of different things. <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't I wouldn't pay myself as an expert in uh, SEO. But uh, no, yeah. I, listen, I, I used to work at big companies. And uh, when you're at big companies, you have big budgets. And you could pay a bunch of smart agency guys like you to come in and, and help. And then I went to smaller startups. And you, when you're in a smaller startup, you're like, dude, where's my budget? And you realize you're like you're not going to have a budget. Yeah. And for, the only way for you to really make an impact from a marketing perspective is to roll up your sleeves and to get in the weeds and figure out, all right, what things can we do to drive this business? And and a lot of it comes down to like like foundational pieces like hey we have to have a great website that tells our story we have to have great seo we have to have a great email program that's going to engage our database um and so i you know when those are your kind of key levers to drive your business you get you get pretty good at them pretty focused on them um and then yeah. you start to you start to test out different paid tactics and you start to invest some money and then you see what returns in our roi and then hopefully if, if you see you know good results you'll spend more on that so so that's yeah, you know, I, I think I, I've gone from a big company marketer to kind of a startup marketer. And now, I mean, Greenlight Guru is a, a you know, it's a mid-sized company, but um, I really like growth companies. That's what's really fun. Uh, but in growth yeah. companies, you got to be really scrappy because you're not going to have the big budgets to go and just blow, you know, you know a million dollars a month on Google AdWords. Right, exactly. All right, well, you ready for the lightning round? Yeah, man, let's do it. All right, here we go. Question number one. If you were to start a side hustle, what side hustle would that be? I think the side hustle for me would probably be uh, like opening uh, some kind of gym. Opening a gym. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm, I'm big into fitness and running and uh, training right now for the New York Marathon. But I I just I, I love the culture around fitness classes and group exercise. And I think I would I would open some kind of gym uh, on the side if I could, uh, if I, if I had any time to do a side hustle, that would probably be my side hustle. I, I just, Interesting. I, I just really, the thing I really like about it is it's amazing when you see people achieve goals that they didn't think they could achieve from a fitness yeah. perspective. Like I never thought I could run a mile and then you run a mile. You're like, oh my gosh, I ran a mile. Now I'm running 10 Ks and half right. marathons. And so it's just very rewarding to see uh, people achieve their fitness goals. And I think if I, if I ever, you know, had to pivot, that that might be something I would do is just open open a local gym and you know help people get healthy and fit. That's awesome. All right. Question number two: top three books or authors or influencers that have made an impact in your career. You know, the the books I think that have made the biggest impact on me um are are probably less conventional than than other marketers would say, but there there's Three books that I would probably uh, call out. Um, the, the first is uh, Influenced by Robert Cialdini, which is really a psychology yep. book about like how people buy and how you influence them. And it's like yep. the classic, uh, really, really good book for anyone just interested in consumer behavior in general. That is the ultimate book to read. So that's one. Um, 
The, the second book is, is not really about marketing, but about leadership. It's called It's Your Ship. Um, and it's about uh, the the Navy commander. I think his name is Michael A- Ashburnoff. I probably just butchered that, but he basically took the lowest performing ship in the Navy to the, to be the highest performing ship in the Navy, and he did it through um, a process of what he calls grassroots leadership. He actually enabled the people under him to come up with the ideas of how to get better. And that's yeah. something I've always really uh, taken to heart. I, I don't want to be the one coming up with the, all all the ideas. I want my team from the the VPs to the directors to the the individual contributors, they're the ones that see the problems firsthand. They need to be the ones coming up with the ideas to fix the problems. Yeah. And so that to me has always been very important. So that book was very influential in my life. And the the third book was um, it's by uh, David Goggins. It's called can't hurt me. Mm -hmm. Um, And I just, I look at that book as just very inspirational. Um, It's a lot about, um, his experience in the military and his experience as a elite endurance athlete and um, his ability to kind of push through pain uh, is just amazing. And in business, uh, we're always dealing with hard things. And and I, I love that book because it's just a lesson in how you kind of attack adversity and how you come out on the other end. So those are the, what I would say, the three books that I look at as kind of foundational to me and, and who I am and how I operate. Um, but I'll I'll make a point about this because I think there's a tendency of people to kind of follow authors, thought leaders. Um, I learn the most, I find, from my peers. And so that's the like the the other point I'd make is in addition to reading thought leaders and and you know, build a really good peer network locally of people mm-hmm. that you can just you know, have lunch with, have breakfast with, get a drink with from time to time and learn from them. And and I think I just learned so much from my peers. That's really the greatest source for me of um, really staying on top of what's new, what's next, what I need to be doing, people helping me see issues a different way. And so that's really um, another recommendation is don't just look at thought leaders um, and content creators, but but look to your peer network because I think that's really where you're going to find solutions to a lot of your problems. Yeah, that's a really good call. All right. And uh, question number three is how do you avoid burnout and how do you help your team to do the same? Yeah. So I think I've, I've probably alluded to this before, uh, but um, I'll, I'll tell a quick story. Earlier in my career, I was working at this company and I had a, it was, everything was off the rails. I, I was, I had really bad relationship with my boss. I had, I had tough peer relationships. I was, I was in a really bad place, but I was doing like the best work I'd ever done in my career, but I was just miserable because of a lot of the internal politics that were happening in the company. Mm. And I remember I would drive into work every day. I would pull into the parking garage. And before I even stepped foot in the office, my blood was boiling. I was just mad. Yeah. And it's a really unhealthy way to live when you're just mad when you're going to work. Because right. I'm just like, God, what, what bullshit am I going to have to deal with today with all with my boss and all these, you know, all these, all my peers who just seem like out to get me? And it, it was just a really, really unhealthy environment. And around that time, I really started um, working out a lot more. And I was running. I was doing these fitness boot camps, and I found that. Uh, the ability to have that outlet really reduced my stress. And, and I, I, I credit uh, exercise really helping me through what was a really, really tough time in my career and coming out on the other end in, in a better place. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, there are tons of benefits to, to exercise from, you know, the mental acuity, just, uh, you know, it, it just like stress reduction, you sleep better. Like, like there's tons of benefits to it. But I think if, if people are are feeling burnt out and are, are just don't know what to do, I, I think you have to look at your physical activity and say, am I, am I exercising enough? Am I doing enough things to take care of my body? Because I think what happens is um, I, like, like it just reduce, if it could reduce your stress level a bit, it makes you feel better. That yeah. might change your attitude when you walk into the office. So um, that that would be my big advice. Get on a, some kind of fitness regimen. So you're, you have that part of your life, you're, you're taking care of yourself. Um, and you're not just all consumed by the stress of the job. So, so stay, yeah. keep 
take care of your physical health. I can certainly attest to that. I was getting, I was getting really crispy, like, uh, sort of late 2020, you know, like through the pandemic and started an exercise routine and felt better, like almost immediately. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of people gained a lot of weight during the pandemic. That was like the, the COVID 15 was a, a thing. Uh, I did the opposite where I lost like 15 pounds because I'm, I was home and, you know, I had the, I had the, Pel- I have the Peloton bike and treadmill and I was just like, well, it's really easy since I'm home to just jump on that every day. I was doing, I was working out like three to four days a week. And all of a sudden I'm working out seven days a week. And, yeah. and the key to, you know, if you want to get better results in your fitness, you either, you know, work out more, you work out harder, or you work out longer. I mean, those are the three levers to, to get better results. And so I just up my frequency of workouts and, and you just ended up getting, you know, losing a lot of weight and feeling better. And, you know, it's now I'm onto my next, uh, my next thing where I'm trying to run a marathon. So I've never run a full marathon before. So I'm, I'm signed up for New York city marathon in a couple months. So that's my, my big goal for, nice. for this year is to be able to complete that marathon. That's awesome. Cool. Well, uh, Jeff, this was amazing. You are an awesome person and a fantastic marketer for everybody listening. If you learned something today or you laughed a little bit, why not drop us a like, drop us a, a comment or a rating. It really would help us out a lot. And, um, Jeff, for everybody that is, uh, curious to learn more about you and or green light guru, where would you direct them? Uh, Anyone could go and uh, look me up on LinkedIn. I'm very active there. I actually post you know almost every day. Uh, and so, yeah, check me out on LinkedIn. And then if you're interested in the book, it's hownottosuckatmarketing.com. Hownottosuckatmarketing.com. So you can go check that out as well. Cool. All right, Jeff, we'll stay on the line. We'll do a wrap. But uh, for everybody else, that was another exciting episode of Revenue Driven CMO. We'll see you next time. And that's a wrap. Thanks for joining us here today. For show notes and other episodes, visit us at revenuedrivencmo.com. That's revenuedrivencmo.com. And hey, exclusive for listeners of this podcast, Web Mechanics will do 10 to 20 hours of work for you for free. Literally no sales calls, no BS. Just give them a problem and they will put a team to work for you for free for 10 to 20 hours. Even if you're already a client, if you're struggling with demand gen, lead gen, SEO, SEM, Google ads, LinkedIn ads, conversion optimization, if you can't get Facebook or meta ads to work for the life of you, or you can't figure out attribution, Web Mechanics will take a good hard look at whatever problem you give them, whatever programs you put in front of them, and they will give you an objective, informed opinion, plus some advice from 10 to 20 hours of senior level attention. And that's just because you're a listener of this podcast. So I would suggest take them up on this offer. It's ridiculous. Go to revenuedrivencmo.com slash free, fill out the two minute form and you will not regret it. Literally zero downside, unlimited potential for growth. So do yourself a favor, revenuedrivencmo.com slash free, no hyphens, no punctuations. You will be happy about that decision.